All right, so today we start a new quarterly, and we're going to be talking about faith. And I want to start out by saying, what is faith? I looked it up on dictionary.com, and it says, complete trust or confidence in something or someone. Our lesson objectives is to discern the importance of faith in Christ, to long for Jesus, not for... Uh, just what he can provide, and to joyfully anticipate the coming of the kingdom. Our key verse is uh, Matthew 16, 16, and it says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's virtually important that uh, we see that Jesus is more than just a good man or a prophet. And in this specific text that we're going over today, it shows in depth that Jesus is more than just a regular old person or just a prophet. It shows that, you know, he is the son of God. And we want to uh, <clears throat> make sure we keep that in our back of our head. The world, as we see it, it says, you know, things like follow your heart. But Jesus tells us to follow him. The world says that we need to believe in ourselves, but Jesus says that we should believe in him. Uh, The world says, be true to you. Jesus says to be true to me. And uh, Jesus, uh, I mean, the world says to discover yourself, but most importantly, that what we're going to be looking at today, Jesus tells us that we should deny ourselves. In Matthew 4, it pictures Jesus facing his wilderness temptations Uh, Again, as we see in chapter 16, Jesus is once again tempted uh, in verse 1. This time it's by the Jews. As we progress through the book of Matthew, we're going to continue to find uh, that Jesus is going to be tempted several more times. And in life, we all get tempted, don't we, sometimes? Uh, Most of us can agree that the world today is full of temptations. First, I want to look at uh, verses 1 through 4 in chapter 16. It says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would sow them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, when it is everything ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern in the face of the sky, but ye do not discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and then shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. They acted together to tempt Jesus, or to test him, and asking uh, him to show them a sign from heaven. And this is proven by the Greek verb that's being behind the word tempting in the King James Version. It's the same verb that Matthew 4, uh, 1 uses when Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Chapter 16, it opens with an unlikely team, the Pharisees and Sadducees. The differences between the Sadducees and Pharisees are normally placed them in their opposition to one another. Um, but their mutual antagonism towards Jesus, they were united. It brought me back to uh, thinking about the show Andy Griffin. Uh, you see the Wakefield and the Carters, they, uh, they butted heads all the time. But when it came to Andy trying to get them together when their daughter and son was going to get together, uh, they turned all their hate towards Andy, and they teamed up on that. So that's kind of what the Sadducees and the Pharisees are doing with Jesus Uh, You see, the Sadducees and Pharisees were requiring a miracle to be performed on commanded to show the fact that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Uh, They didn't believe that Jesus could give them such a sign, which for them, that was proof that he wasn't God. Their question was a trap for Jesus. But before responding to their question regarding the sign, Jesus committed that the Pharisees were like forecasting weather responding to signs like the redness of the sky, concerning whether it was going to be an overcast or a fair day. Um, But they were very poor with their ability to see or interpret the very obvious signs of the times. 
all around them, it's, it's perhaps to best see the signs of the times as Jesus used this context as referring to the history of redemption and the acts of God and the presence through which he reveals salvation through Jesus Christ. Uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees had access to all the prophecies and the revelations of God and in the history of his people. But as you see, uh, they had seen numerous signs and wonders that Jesus had performed in their midst, yet they were still looking for something more, something more so they could say that, you know, he wasn't the Messiah, that he was just this ordinary man that had a little bit of luck. They were all about saying that he wasn't the Messiah. If you see in verse 4, Christ answered the Pharisees and the Sadducees with a question directly. He responded by saying that they are a part of a larger group, wicked and adulterous generation that seek a sign. And wicked describes the evil hearts of these men, and adulterous speaks on their spiritual unfaithfulness and the absence of the exclusive love and loyalty for the Lord. Jesus wasn't fooled by their outward religiously, but he knew their hearts. And Jesus <clears throat> gave them not a definite sign, but the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah refers to Jesus' burial and resurrection. The fact that Jesus would be buried and three days later he would um, rise again from the grave and that's kind of like Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the big fish for three days and after three days the big fish spit Jonah out. And if you look uh, at Matthew 12 40 it says that for Jonah was the three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Some have wondered this type of symbol is similar to Jesus' burial since the gospel tells us, you know, Jesus rose th after three days and three nights. In the Jewish tradition, three days and three nights may refer to three days or a comp uh, combination of three separate days. But after this episode, Jesus left the Pharisees and Sadducees going across the lake with their disciples. The second thing I want to break down is verses 5 through 12. And that says, And when his disciples were came to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of leaven and the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. Do ye not understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves or the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand? I spake to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then understood they how they had blamed them, not beware of the leaven and bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you see Jesus' uh, redirection of his disciples is what that is basically saying. The disciples got to the other side of the wake and they forgot about, you know, the bread and anything to eat. But Jesus interrupts the disciples and is talking in a discussion about getting the bread and said, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Take heed and beware means to be on one's guard against. Teaching of these groups might appear to be true, but then Jesus warned against them. As the disciples could think about their own hunger and lack of bread, therefore they immediately assumed Jesus' comment about the leaven, uh, referred to the fact they had forgotten to bring the bread. Thus they had failed looking for the obvious, deeper meaning to what Jesus was saying. And you see in verse 8, uh, Jesus rebuked them, saying that they had little faith, being more worried about what they were going to eat than what Jesus had to say to them. And that's kind of you know, like us today. Um, not necessarily what we're going to eat, but we're more worried about worldly things rather than what Jesus has for us. Um, 
I know me, myself included, uh, we, we tend to look at what the world has more than what Jesus has for us. And like I started out saying, um, you know, the world, they'll sit there and tell you to follow your heart. But you look in the Bible and God's word and God says to follow me. And in the world, you know, they're telling you to believe in yourself. You can do this, but, you know, Jesus tells us in his word to believe in him. The world tells us to discover ourselves. Jesus tells us uh, later on in chapter 16 to deny ourselves. And then the world, you know, tells us that we should be true to ourselves, but really we should be true to God. And, you know, the world's a very deceiving place and easily uh, able to tangle us up and to tempt us with things. And it's, it's easy to, once you start reading this, uh, you see how it applies to you today. Um, there may be things that get you tangled up in the world today. There may be things that, um, you know, not get you off the path of what you're trying to take. And, you know, I challenge each and every one, myself included, that, you know, we should dig more into the world and deny ourselves, and that way we can not... Uh, you know, live to the world, but live for Christ. And <clears throat> we'll see that uh, in verses 9 and 10, he reminded them uh, two times that he fed the multitudes. Jesus got back on his main point in verse 11. He said, in essence, how could you think I was talking about bread? Don't you understand? I'm talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What is the leaven or yeast that Jesus spoke of is a common question we could ask ourselves. But in verse 12, Jesus explains that the leaven was the doctrine or teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees, which the disciples should beware. The term leaven was used to demonstrate how their doctrine affected their entire belief system, and the same way leaven affects the whole batch of bread. Uh, the Pharisees... Uh, had a tradition that wrapped their understanding of obedience to the written law. If you look back at Matthew uh, 15, verses 3 through 6, that says, But he answered unto them and said, Why do ye also transgress the commandment by your God, your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he curses the fa father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whoever shall say this to his father or his mother is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. Then verse 6 says, And honor not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus, he, uh, just, thus have ye made the commandment of God of none affect you by your tradition. And you see that the Sadducees' unbelief in the uh, supernatural had led them to deny some of the Old Testament most basic teachings that we know, you know, one of the commandments to honor thy father and mother. Uh, one of the application points that our quarterlies have, I really like this, it says false teaching can be deceptively small yet carry deadly potential. As leaven is left alone, it will penetrate and permit the whole. Not, no straying from absolute truth is right. Even though we will not be able to settle all of our questions, this does not mean we take the relaxed approach to God's revelation. Error opposes God and falsifies his creation. The uh, next point I want to look at and break down is our faith properly channeled. And that's going to be verses 13 and 14. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of uh, Cassandra Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am the Son of Man? And they said, Say that thou art John the Baptist's son, and others, Jeremiah and one of the prophets. He saying to them, But whom say ye that I am? And we see that uh, Matthew goes directly at what happened in Philippi and an event that got to hear the heart of God that was core of his life. And you look back in Luke 9, 18, Jesus spent some time in prayer. Then he asked his disciples a crucial question recorded by Matthew 
in the later part of uh, verse 13, he says, Whom do men say that I am the Son of Man? Jesus wanted his followers to think about who he was and what he came to do with the goal of getting them to affirm his unique identity. And the answer to the first question is the disciple replied that the various people believed that Jesus was to be John the Baptist who had risen from the dead. This was what Herod believed otherwise. Others thought Jesus was Elijah to come back to prophecy about the Messiah who was yet to come. Some thought Jesus might be Jeremiah, perhaps of his mixture of authority and suffering and the fact that he, like Jeremiah, was some sort of prophet of doom for Israel. Uh, still others think that Jesus was just one of the prophets. What is striking about this list is that despite the people what they thought about is something important that, you know, it's spiritual, it's miraculous about Jesus. The popular conceptions had nothing to do with Jesus' messiahship. They had failed to see that Jesus was the long-promised messiah. Despite from all the signs that, you know, they had and what was being performed right in front of their eyes, they, you know, it's kind of like us. You know, God gives us a sign like it was talking about earlier in Jonah, God gives us a sign and flat out tells us to do something, but yet we kind of ignore that for a second. We put it apart and we ignore it right when it's right in our face and we still, you know, ignore that fact and it's right in front of us, but we just don't really want to accept that. The next thing I want to break down is uh, this, the disciples' perception of Jesus and that's verses 15 and 16. Verse 15 says, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus got into the heart of the matter in verse 15. He wanted the disciples to confess to him of what their view of his identity was. Simon Peter answered Jesus, speaking for the other disciples, and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. In verse 16, Peter's confession of Jesus was Jesus' identity was filled with meaning. He was affirming that Jesus' Messiahship was the Christ, and in Greek language that translate Christ means Messiah. He was also affirming that Jesus' deity was Jesus is the Son of God. Thus, Peter's confession includes an affirmation of both Jesus as Messiah and Jesus as God's Son. Next thing is verses 17, 17 through 20, and that's the building of the church. And Jesus answered and said to them, Blessed are thou, Simon, Barona, the flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and, I set, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt blind on earth and bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. They charged his disciples and that they should tell him no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Peter's confession of Jesus is true. Jesus' agreement with Peter is demonstrated that Jesus immediately blessed him uh, Christ says, Blessed are thou, Simon. Jesus affirmed the origin, origin of Peter's confession was not gleaned by human reasoning. Uh, no person had convinced Peter of Jesus' identity. The Father, through the Spirit, had applied to teachings and the work of Jesus and to his heart that led us through conversation. Verse 18 is one of the most... Uh, controversial in the history of uh, Christianity, taken by itself with no reference to the wilder spiritual text, it was perfectly clear that this word, upon his rock, uh, refers to Protestants have uh, traditionally identified the reference to, uh, to two possible views. The first one, the rock refers to Christ. Um, as you see in uh, 1 Corinthians 3.11 for support, uh, we'll flip over there and check it out. First Corinthians 3.11 says, 
for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Then the second thing that uh, the, the rock refers to is Peter's confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, as you see in verse 16. Therefore, the rock of the foundation of the church is the confession of Peter, which ultimately became the doctrine of its apostles. Uh, the proponents, uh, to the reference of Acts 2.42, they are some scholars who had a combination of both views. They suggested that the truth was realized when Jesus said, Upon the rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church, the scarce assembly of God's called out people, will be built on Christ and confessed by the church. Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. The good news with reference to the church is that Jesus assures his power of Satan and his forces of evil will not succeed uh, in destroying the church because the found foundation is sure. As you see in verse 19, it's also a difficult passage to interpret. And you flip over to uh, Matthew 16, verse 19, it says, And I will give ye the keys unto the, the keys of hev kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Although Jesus uh, directed his words to Peter, he was talking to Peter who represented all of Christ's disciples or followers, including us today. Uh, you know, he says in verse 19 that his disciples, uh, he will give them the keys to the kingdom of heaven, which means access um, all believers as disciples of Christ have free access to the kingdom of heaven because of, you know, their salvation with Christ. Although believers do not have access to all the powers of the earthly authorities and kingdoms, Christ says that we have free access to the powers of the kingdom of heaven. Again, this power is uh, for all Christ's disciples. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, that applies to you. You have access through Jesus Christ to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it's a very powerful text to think about. And if you break it down, you know, wondering what exactly does Jesus mean. He means that the truth is uh, that believers in Christ have access to the resources of heaven. They pray and ask for God's help. The parallel message in Matthew 18, 18 through 19, if you flip over there, it says that, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree that the earth is touching, anything that they shall ask, is, it shall be done for them on my Father which is in heaven." And you see that that's kind of that goes hand in hand with uh, chapter 16. What it's saying, it reveals more about the meaning of the phrase. Uh, verse 19 says, "If two of you shall agree on the earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them on my Father which is in heaven." Some interpreters see this verse as giving their disciples power in making decisions to, uh, about forbidding or allowing certain practices, but others believe that it speaks of the power of the church leaders to decide who can be admitted into the church and who it must be excluded. It certainly does not apply to a priest about solving, uh, absolving people of their sins. If you look in verse 20, Jesus instructed the disciples not to tell them uh, anyone who he is. In time, he would instruct them to spread the good news throughout all the lands. But he knew that in that time, for its kind of uh, proclamation, it wasn't right. He said, I will build my church. These words have offered hope and comfort to many a troubled heart. This is true springs from what he spoke to the world in existence. Uh, he commands the storms to cease and tramples upon the greatness enemy of humanity, death. He is Jesus Christ and he is the Lord of all. Second, 
It's his church. The instruction he founded lies near to his heart. Um, it was for he that he shed his blood for us. It was he, for us that he arose. It was for us that he will come again. And as his possession, the church takes orders from no one other than the kingdom of God. Finally, the words of Jesus reveal surely that he will build the church. There is no question whether Christ will prevail. Um, one of our another application points is says that he has privileged us to be a part of this labor, that we are his hands and feet. We are the messengers of the light. God surely will build his church, but he will do it through his servants. Me personally, I think it's pretty cool that we as Christians get to have a part of you know that construction um, that God considers us his hands and feet we're doing his work down here as Christians we're called to stand out and be different and spread his word and to build that foundation down here so that they can enjoy the key the keys to the kingdom of heaven the next thing I want to break down <coughs> is uh, faith rewarded and it's summing up uh, or verses 21 through 27. And it says, From that time forth began Jesus to shew upon his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest none, not of the things that be of God, but those that are of men. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. After discussing his uh, messiahship with the disciples, after uh, their affirmation of that messiahship, Jesus quite unexpectedly to them shared with them that uh, what would lay again. You know, he would be killed in Jerusalem. He would be hung on that cross, but he would rise again on that third day. This surprised the disciples that Christ had just not said what he had promised of Israel, the Messiah. Um, you know, they're sitting there thinking, like, he's, he's proclaiming what's going to happen. So, you know, but going back to the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're saying, oh, he's just a great prophet. He's just uh, another man that's spreading God's word of the Messiah that's yet to come. But Jesus is telling them here, he's like, hey, no, like, I'm going to go to Jerusalem I'm going to die upon that cross, and three days later, I'm going to rise again. And I can only imagine what's going through their minds at that time. They're probably mind-blown, like, what in the world is this man talking about? Like, he's sitting here saying he's going to go to Jerusalem, and he's going to die on a cross, and then three days later, he's going to, go, he's going to ascend back to heaven, and he's going to do all this stuff. Like, you know, their mind's probably going 100 miles an hour. And, you know, you got Peter that is questioning Jesus. And, uh, you know, Jesus says uh, in verse 23, Get behind thee, uh, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not of things that be of God, but those as of men. As you see, uh, the disciples' confusion was that Jesus was uh, rebuked Peter in uh, 23. It says, Get behind me, Satan. Uh, it contrasts these verses in 17 through 19 where Peter, though the power of God confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, God's son, now he's allowing Satan to use him to think in terms that uh, not Christ-centered but man-centered. Jesus wanted the disciples to understand not only who he was, but he was the long-awaited Messiah and the God of all ages, but he wanted his followers to understand his work. Jesus came to earth to live a sinless life, to die a sacrificial death, and rise victoriously from the grave so that we could be saved for our sins and that we would not be, have that separation between us and God that's full of sin. Uh, the last thing I want to break down 
is uh, 24 through 26. And I got ahead of myself a little bit, but it says, Thou said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what a man is profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus moved from the discussion of his work on the cross to a discussion of how that work would impact the way that the disciples lived their life. You know, he says that if any man will deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, this statement to the disciples was one, uh, one crazy statement to think about. Because of their discipleship, because of their resolve and determination to follow Christ, they're going to suffer. And you think about Jesus tells us, <clears throat> you know, I say it all the time, our lives aren't going to be rainbows and puppy dogs. Like, everything's not going to be great because we're Christian. God says that we're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. Uh, we're going to have problems. But, you know, w we shouldn't worry because God's with us and God's overcame the world. So, you know, if he can overcome the world, then he can take whatever problem you have and he can overcome that with a blink of the eye because he overcame the world. Uh, we as Christians, we must be prepared to suffer for Christ's sake, uh, to take up your cross if we are to be true of his followers. Jesus made that clear what it seems for human perspective to be sacrificial is not so divine and perspective. Uh, to save your life means to give it up for Christ. In verse 25, uh, the thought of taking up my cross, giving up my life, is kind of frightening, you know, especially in the light of the fact that uh, I could have much of what the world has to offer is what people think, you know. This world can offer me so much, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I need to take up my cross, you know. The, the world promises me this, but, you know, as I start out, you know, we shouldn't be wondering or giving in to what the world says that they have to offer us. You know, Jesus has a lot more than this world could ever offer us. And as true Christians, we should die for the world and live for God, and we should be a light for him. And, uh, you know, it says, if I refuse to take up my cross <clears throat> and give me life, it says in verse 26 with a question, uh, what profit really comes to a person if he gains the entire world but loses his own soul? I was reminded of a quote. Uh, you know, it says that if you're wrong about God, then you've wasted your life. But it, uh, if I'm wrong about God, then you've wasted your life. But if you're wrong about God, then you've wasted your eternity. And that hits hard because, you know, <clears throat> there's some people out there that won't ever accept Jesus Christ. And, you know, they'll sit there and tell you and argue with you that, you know, Jesus isn't real, that um, it's just a book just like, you know, you can go to the bookstore and pick up another fairy tale, that it's, it's not real, all those stories are made up, and it's sad because, you know, they're like, how could, what do you do if, like, you know, you lived all your life and you die, and one day you realize that there is no God, and, I, you know, like this quote says, you, you wasted your life, you know, but then you turn it around and say, you know, what if you're wrong? What if you go your whole life and say that there is no God, there is no, uh, the Bible is not real and all this. Then when you get to heaven, when you die and you sit there in amazement, you're like, uh, and, he, you know, you wasted your eternity. You know, you've had chance after chance after chance to accept Jesus and people be a follower to you, you know, to, of Jesus to you and bring the gospel to you but you refuse to take that, then one day when you go to the judgment, you're going to be sitting there like, man, I really should have listened. This stuff's real. And, you know, when I, when I read that verse, that's what that quote popped up to me. And uh, it was kind of weird how it popped up. I was Googling some <clears throat> uh, study scriptures for this, and that quote just popped up out of nowhere. And I was like, man, that's a pretty cool quote. And, uh, but, you know, it really hits us home 
that, uh, you know, in verse 26, it says that Jesus says that, you know, if you gain the entire world, uh, but loses your own soul, you know, and that, you, no matter what this world has to offer you, it's never going to be enough what Jesus, compared to what Jesus has to offer you. Um, you know, they can promise you anything in this world, and it's not going to be as great as when God gives you the keys to the kingdom, and, you know, he calls you home and says, good job, my faithful servant. Um, you know, to live for this world, like, it, it's sad, especially the way the world is now. You know, there's so many, so many things that, uh, temptations and trials and stuff like that that, you know, you don't need to get tied up in, because I, I can say that, you know, in my past, I've been tied up with things. I've uh, gave in to worldly things. I've uh, put my faith sometimes in worldly things, but I'm here to tell you that it doesn't work out, and I'm living proof of that. And, you know, if I didn't have Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior, there ain't no way that I would be here today. And especially, you know, uh, looking back on my career when I was a cop, if you would have, I, I got to spend... Uh, one of my good friends uh, passed away. He committed suicide that I worked with as a cop a couple of weeks ago. I went to his funeral, and uh, all everybody there was like, oh, what are you doing now, Justin? I was like, I'm going into ministry. I'm going to be a pastor. And they're like sitting there looking at me like, what? I'm like, yeah. And uh, they was like, no, seriously, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going into ministry. I'm going to be a pastor. And they're like, oh, you're serious? I'm like, yeah. And, you know, they're sitting there in amazement because they knew who I was before Jesus took a hold of me. And, you know, looking back at that person that I was, I'm not proud of that person. Um, I wasn't a bad person, so to speak, but I wasn't who God wanted me be, to be, who God called me to be. But thankfully, by the grace of God, he got a hold of me 